Great morning to be here. Loved our time of worship so far. and uh, We are traveling through the summer of 2020. And when school has... 2022? Wow, time flies. And here we are again. And, uh, and yet it's still... Even though school starts this week, it's still short season. And so, you know, the dress code is met. Uh, we have been talking about uh, just a lot of different topics. We're going to start a series that I'm pretty excited about uh, in the fall, in, in uh, on September, when September arrives, which is not that far from now. But uh, today, I want to talk. I want to talk just a little bit about loyalty and the idea of a uh, what would you call it? A uh, bandwagon fan. What's that? What's a bandwagon fan? Somebody come just out of the out of the audience. What's it, what does it mean? That what does that mean? Okay, that's wrong. Wrong answer. Yeah, you like them because everybody else likes them and they're doing good. You know, they're doing great. And so among the people who might live close to this area, when it comes to the sport of baseball, you smell some bandwagon fans. But among us, not me, but among us, there's some true, what we call the opposite of a bandwagon fan, loyal Rangers fans. And I can tell by some of the, one of the ways I kind of notice a person's loyalty is what kind of uh, stickers do they put on their vehicles? And so... Uh, Sometimes that's not a good thing. Have you ever bought a car that had some stickers on the vehicle that you didn't want to be on your car? Because, you know, you didn't want to be labeled as a loyal fan of whatever that idea or uh, that organization was. But uh, we are, one of the things I want to talk about, and we'll get to, into the story of Joshua in just a minute. The idea of being loyal. I, I nailed it. Okay, Jeremy, confess underneath my shirt here, down in my tattoo area. I want, I don't have, but I want a NY, the, you know, because I've been a Yankees fan, but I've been a Yankees fan even when they were terrible. And, you know, over the years that I've been a Yankees fan, They've been terrible a few times. Not that often, though. <laughs> but we are loyal to different things in different ways. And uh, one of the things, for instance, I'm loyal to my family. Uh, when my family, when my mom and my dad and my sisters, as we grew up, the six of us, we were together and we were straighters. And that was important. But, but since then, as my family has grown, uh, I'm loyal to my sons and to my wife and, and, and to my in-laws even, even though sometimes everyone that I've just named is crazy. Have you ever been loyal to someone or some person and, and they're nuts? <laughs> yeah, that happens sometimes. Yeah, I, I see. I see this going on between y'all right over there, uh, but you're not on their side because they're right. You're on their side because you love them. You're loyal to them in that way. But we're loyal to other things too. We're loyal to our nation. We are loyal to perhaps our state. I can remember. I grew up in Texas till in eighth grade. Moved to. Uh, Seoul, Korea, and then moved to Junction City, Kansas. And when I came to Kansas as a ninth grader, 
uh, I was the guy from Texas. And I was proud of it. I was proud to be the one who had an, an accent. I'm like, I ain't got no accent. <laughs> but to those Kansas kids, I did. Because I was loyal to Texas, and I had grown up, I, I drank all the Texas Kool-Aid there is. And, uh, of course, I've grown out of that and to know that, you know, a lot of that was misinformation. But nevertheless, I was a believer. I was a believer. Uh, and, and, and I've been loyal to my job. I, was, I worked at ACU for 40 years. And looking back on all these loyalties, I can see that maybe I put too much loyalty into those things. I want us to pray for just a second. God, let us hear a message from you today that each one in their own individual way and us as a collective body might hear your truth today. Father, I know as the words come out of my mouth, oftentimes they are not exactly what you had in mind. So I pray that your Holy Spirit does work as your spirit speaks today. In Jesus' name. Amen. One of the troubles that maybe you've had in this idea of loyalty is when you're loyal to more than one thing and then you uh, have a uh, clash of loyalties. And this happened to me when I, uh, in, in several sports settings, where all of a sudden I would have two favorite teams and I've come to recognize you can't have two favorite teams because eventually if they play each other, now what you going to do? Uh, and this is not exactly that. Even more bluntly, Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 6 that uh, you can't have two masters. And what's a trouble is when you do have divided loyalties. When I married Mary Beth, uh, she's from Oklahoma. And I have been for tech, from Texas. Now, she, she lived a lot of her life in, Oklahoma, in Texas because she married the Texan. Uh, but when I became her husband and went up to Oklahoma City, to Edmond, Oklahoma, where her mother lives and her brother lives, it, it, I became very way aware that Oklahoma is not like Texas, and yet it is. And when it comes to the sport of football, Oklahoma people are as crazy as Texas people. And, and so I'm in this new family, and they are Oklahoma Sooner fans. And that's trouble. Because even though I'd kind of given up my Longhorn fan status once I actually got into college and coached for a different school and changed a little bit of how I felt about things. Oklahoma, for me, was always, the Sooners were always the bad guys. But you know what? You can't serve two masters. I dropped the Longhorn, I dropped all Texas schools in a heartbeat. You know why? I wanted to, I wanted to get in good with my mother-in-law. And it worked. Man, I got me some OU gear. She gave me some OU t-shirts. I wear them. I know all about the team. I was not having a divided loyalty between me and my family over a football team. You know what I'm saying? Just, it, it worked. Now, I know there have been times in my life when I was less uh, mature and less wise, and I would have hung in there and fought it out. But you know, you've heard the idea of choosing your battles. That's not the one I wanted to fight with my family. Football? You kidding me? But sometimes our our loyalties are, and and the choice we have to make about it is more important than a football team. And so the idea of Jesus saying you can't serve two masters, I, I think this plays out well in the story of Joshua uh, giving his last speech. And, and there's a little background of the people he's speaking to. He's speaking to the nation. 
And I always, I'm so curious when Moses or Joshua or David or some big leader would speak then, because, I mean, they didn't have sound systems. How did that work? But uh, he's talking to thousands of people here, and he's talking to the people. And uh, he's telling them in this last speech he makes, He's telling them something very important, but there's a background that goes to it. This pe- these people came from Abraham. And so first there was Abraham. God calls Abraham. Abraham chooses God and he's faithful to God. Abraham has a son. His son is Isaac. God's passing that on down to Isaac. And, and then Isaac has two sons and it's Jacob and Esau. And there's a little battle between Jacob and Esau, but there's, the real thing is, are they going to follow God? Are they going to trust God? And so Jacob, after wrestling with God, chooses God, and he has a bunch of boys. And so he has some girls too, but the boys he had 12 sons, and eventually they go down to Egypt. And when they get to Egypt, this is what started with Abraham. Now has come, there are about 70 of them. And they get there, and they're, they're worshiping Yahweh. These 70, they're worshiping Yahweh. And they come into a country, Egypt, and they become slaves, but they become very popular. I mean, the populous. There's a bunch of them. And they're there for 400 years as slaves. And, but they've grown to almost half a million people. And so this half a million people, slaves, still worshiping Yahweh, sort of. And then God, God rescues them. And, and the rest of their lives, this is the greatest event in their history, is that God rescued them. He sent the plagues. He sent Moses. They walked through the Red Sea. But they traveled in the wilderness for 40 years because they were knuckleheads. Have you ever had to, have you ever had to sit in some of the uh, consequences of your knuckleheadedness? That's them. 40 years. 40 years. And then... They take the land, they go into the promised land, and Joshua leads them. And they conquer the whole promised land. But that takes another 40 years. And so for 480 years, they've been from slaves to in the wilderness to conquerors. And 480 years since they've come from Egypt. And then Joshua is telling them this speech in Joshua chapter 24. And I want to read this to you. He says, so, and he's done the summary too. He did a summary, but I like my summary. I mean, mine's not going to be in the Bible, but I I liked it. And so he gets to this point and he says, now you're here. And he says, so now, now on this day that I'm giving this speech, remember you guys, we've been in free for 480 years. He said, now the fear of the Lord, now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. And this, this line right here just blows my mind. So throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and, and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Like, what? You guys have been free for generations. 80 years since they left Egypt. But they still got some of those gods with them. They have some actual idols made out of gold or silver or wood with them. They carried these with them. What? They're praying. They got the t- they've got the tabernacle that they did all that stuff through. They're, they're following this cloud and they're, and, but in their backpack, they've got this idol. He says, so throw them away. And he says, and hey, listen, if this is the, First line in this stand, stand. listen, (laughs) if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, see you later, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. Choose for this day. Who are you going to be loyal to? Who are you going to be loyal to? Serve, choose this day for yourselves who you will serve, whether it's the God of your ancestors or is it the living God. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. 
Question. Who do you serve today? Who are you loyal to? Who is the king of your life? Because these guys, they, they loved Yahweh. They, they were brought out. They've now gotten all this land, man. They're excited. They're getting ready to start a new nation right here, and they're excited about it. But you know what? Just what about plan B? I'm going to have an extra. I'm going to keep this other idol too. It wasn't that they were necessarily not loyal to. They had divided loyalties. They were trying to serve two masters. As long as things are going good with Yahweh, okay. But what about when the drought comes? Or when someone is sick? Or some other kind of political problem or pressure? I might need to pull out my ah, backup, God. I've got a backup. Got a Yahweh and then I got a backup. Who is the king of your life? So here's the psalmist praying this prayer in Psalm 86. He prays this prayer in verse 11, the second part of it. He says, give me an undivided heart. This is what loyalty is. It's having an undivided heart that I may fear, that I may worship your name. Give me an undivided heart. This is what I'm asking God for in my prayers today. Give me an undivided heart. Give me an undivided heart. And so I ask myself the question, is my loyalty to God divided? Do I have divided loyalty? And I, and I think, what is my really true daily focus? Where do I put my trust? Well, one of the stories I've told here several times is from I, from Rob Bell and his boys walking. He and his boys are walking along the beach and they're picking up shells. And they're looking at shells on the beach. And if you ever walked on the beach and picked up shells, you know, most of them are nasty. I mean, you might every once in a while find a real shell, but most of them are broken parts of shells. And then there's some little bitty ones. And some, well, they're walking down this ocean sh- uh, beach and they're picking up shells and they see just out in the water just right out not far away from the shore they see a starfish floating there and then man that would be the catch that would be the best thing to have and so one of the boys he's like i want a starfish go get it so he goes out to the starfish and he starts walking and about halfway there he turns around to his dad and he has this really troubled look on his face And it's like, I don't know what to do. He said, go get it. It's right there. Go get it. So he goes out to the starfish and he turns around again. Why don't you grab the starfish? It's right there. Get it. And he says, Dad, I can't because my hands are full of shells. You got to make a decision in your lawyer. What do I want? Who am I going to choose this day? Who are you going to serve? Who is going to be the king, the master, the ruler, the Lord of your life? It's so, a lot of times, you know, different people in their prayers call, speak to God different ways. Uh, And as I always notice how people say their prayers. So if you've prayed today already, I've noticed checking you out. Uh, Like, do you call God Father? That's me mostly. Do you call him God? Do you call him Lord? Well, he is all of those. But when you call him Lord, you're making a decision about loyalty. You're saying, you're my boss. You're the one and only boss I've got. I am loyal to you. I don't have plan B. I got all my eggs in this one basket. I'm loyal to you. So quickly, the, the idea of loyalty, and I'm going to talk about some he, Hebrew words, which you guys may get tired of that, but I never do. So if you're stuck with me, you're going to get it one way or another. Last year, we were, had a series about Micah, went up and we talked all through the book of Micah. And uh, I always think, you know, I need to have tests when you come, because I am a teacher by nature. I want to have 
quizzes. So, but, no. Do you remember Micah? Well, we talked about Micah, and we get down to Micah 6, 8, you know, the juice, really, of, of it. And we talked about these two Hebrew words, ahava and kesed. So let's, let's do a little review. Ahava, you say ahava. One more time. Ahava. And you got to do the on this one, so it's kesed. But you get subtly, you know, don't spit out it. Kesed. Kesed. Yeah. So they both mean love. They both mean love. Uh, ahava is like this passionate pursuit of something. I love dogs. Not really, but I, I, you, something you love. I love my wife. I love, I want an intimate relationship. I love, and that's what you want. This is a passionate pursuit. It's endurance. It has to do with grit. I want some, it's part of my desire. I love it. I enjoy it. I want it. I'm going to pursue it. And it's a good thing, depending on what you're loving, depending on what you ahava. Well, he says what he wants you to ahava is kased, kased. So that also means love, steadfast love, most often translated, it's translated several ways, but most often steadfast love. So the lesson I gave last year was the title of it is Love, Love, because that's what he's saying. I want you to love, love. Now, in most translations, it says love, mercy, because mercy is also part of Kesed. Mercy is part of it, and so is loving kindness. Like we sang the word that is in Psalm 118, the song we sang today, about, you know, your, your loving kindness. When you look at the Hebrew of that, that word is Kesed. Loving kindness. It means loving kindness. It means steadfast love. It means loyalty. A lot of the ways it's translated as loyalty. Because that is what this kind of love, and most of the time it's used, it has to do with the love God has for people. That this is steadfast love for people. And so in this idea of loyalty, while we're, I want us to be checking out today our own loyalty, but also I want us to recognize the loyalty God has for us. And that is steadfast love. So this verse here, uh, blessed be the Lord, okay? And, and this these next line of things is all one word. It's all said, blessed be the Lord. Said one translation, my loyal one. One is steadfast love. One is faithful. One. And one, this is in the New Living Translation, is my loving ally. These are descriptions by the psalmist in, one, in 144, Psalm 144, descriptions, his describing God. This is who God is to me. He is my loyal. He's loyal to me. He's loyal to me. He has steadfast love, love that never gives up, never gives up on me. Now, I am wanted to, and again, uh, been kind of a crazy week here, so the PowerPoint went through several changes, and one of it had all of Psalm 86 on it. And, and the part of Psalm 86 that we just read about, give me an undivided heart, Here's what it starts, though. Verse 11 says, Teach me your ways that I may rely on your faithfulness. That's the word cassette. That I may rely on your loyalty. Think about that. I'm going to have an undivided heart because I'm going to rely on his undivided heart. Does that make sense? I'm going to be loyal because he is loyal. Or as John put it in 1 John, I love him. We love him because he first loved us. And in, in many ways, we've not been loyal. This is something we need to come at. In so many ways, I've been loyal only to myself. Or I've chosen some other thing or person or principle or idea to be loyal to. I haven't been faithful always. But God is 
And because God is faithful, because God is loyal, I want to choose this day who I'm going to serve. It's going to be Yahweh. And I want to do that every day. If we are faithless, 1 Timothy says, 2 Timothy, He will remain faithful for He cannot disown Himself. What does this mean? It means this is who God is. He is faithful. He does have unfailing love for us. He is loyal to His people, His creation. He is on your side. He has chosen you. And then He asked back, will you choose me? Because I love you. This is the love of God that doesn't demand, it invites this other verse, this is a difficult verse. You know, there's difficult verses that don't, you know what that is? A difficult verse is one is that I don't completely don't understand what it talks about at all, or it doesn't jive with what I already think. I hate when the Bible does that. I hate when I've got an idea and then the Bible says, no, that ain't it. So I do what I'm going to do today. I'm going to try and make sense of it. So the people back in Joshua's speech, right? He says, choose this day. And, and they said, yes, we will. Far be it from us to forsake the Lord. That's who we're going to choose. Now, you know, right after this, they're going to go through the book of Judges where they're up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So, you know, not like anybody I know today. So Joshua says to them, you are not able to serve the Lord. I'm like, what? Be like a little kid come down to get baptized. Says, Not today, buddy. Go on back. Get on back there. Or an adult. You're not able to serve him because he's a holy God. He's a perfect. He's an awesome. Yeah. And he is a jealous God. He's not going to put up with your divided loyalty. And he will not forgive your sins. And I'm like, see, that verse shouldn't be in there. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, bad news for you. You're going to, disaster is going to come on you. And so I think of this story. And then we're going to sing after I tell this little story about Peter and Jesus. God is. Well, always, and this is the story that played out in Judges. God will always be there when His people turn to Him. But when he, they turn away from Him, they can't, there's nothing for them to receive because they're not asking for it. They're not focused on Him. They're not being loyal to Him as long as that, all they need to do is say, help me. So Peter's in, in the boat and there's a storm. And as the storm is going on, the guys are terrified. They think they're going to die. And then they see Jesus. They think it's a ghost at first, they're walking on the water. And they go, whoo! And Peter says, if it's you, let me come out to you. And, and Jesus says, come on. Peter gets out in the water. And he starts walking on the water, just like these Israelites were getting ready to start living in their land. Everything was going to be good. But then it says he looked and he saw the storm and he doubted. Boom, he goes down. And, and I'm thinking about these moments. Just think about these moments where Peter was underwater. What? what? Have you ever thought about that? What, what was he? What was going on, you know? He's underwater. And then what happens? Jesus reaches for him. And he reaches for Jesus. And you know for us today, he's always ready for you. He's always ready. And for us, I'm looking around at this group today. 
We know that, don't we? Sometimes we, we struggle with it because His love is so overwhelming. But don't we also have friends that we can share this good news with? Because this is good news. He's always, His love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Let's stand. We're going to sing, Oh, How He Loves. And there's a part, there's two parts of this song. One is, I know there's about so many, several parts, <laughs> but one is the idea that if grace was an ocean, I'd be sinking. <laughs> it's so overwhelming. His grace is so overwhelming. He loves us. He loves us. Let's stand it.